It's a really good start. Um, welcome. Uh, I'm Scottish, so this means I'm going to have a very big moan about services that piss me off. You're about to get a little insight into my very sad life of capturing service experiences um, that fail for me. Um, I thought I'd start here. Dear British Airways, on the 10th of November, at the time of 1955, I flew out from London Heathrow to JFK. We arrived at what would be British time, 3.55 a.m. It was late, I was tired, and we were nearly the last passengers off of the flight. After a long wait at visa inspection, uh, there were a few bags left. A black Dunlop suitcase came past, I picked it up and left the airport. We arrived at the Box House Hotel around 11.30 p.m. local time. I open the case and I find three pairs of socks, two pairs of boxers, a rugby shirt, and a tab of Viagra. <laughs> this is a true story. <laughs> this is my life. I realized at this point I had the same bag, but the contents were not mine. I went straight onto Google, and I tried to find the number for a BA, called the British number, called the US number. Basically, nothing was open, told to call back uh, at normal hours. Uh, and then tried to call you at 7 a.m. Uh, I cost my mobile a ton in charges. I was rerouted through three different lines which I had to hang up and call again. I was given somebody who had no idea how to solve my problem, but I knew exactly what the problem was. I was then routed to a website where I was asked to sign up as a member of BA just so I could get help from you. As a customer, all I wanted to know was that you could contact the other person who'd taken the same bag as me because I'd solved the problem for you and put us in contact with one another. That's all I wanted, but no. You continued to try and drag it out. You told me to take the case back to the airport. I explained that I was too busy. I was there for business. I didn't have time. I needed some clothes to wear. I needed to brush my teeth. And then you sent me to what can only be described as the end of the internet. <laughs> 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 to get a quicker response, I then went on to Twitter. I spoke with lots of people, including Lola, Jason, Chris, and Daniel. And I tried to get help from you to see if we could actually get the bag swapped. You were quite responsive, but your whole total sum of responsiveness was to actually accuse me of theft, of taking somebody else's bag. So I tried calling again. I spent ages on the phone. Oh, no, our sound's off. OK. Oh. Very loud phone. <laughs> Just because I was really angry. <laughs> and. Uh, <laughs> Um, and I spent a whole two days calling you back and forth just to find out if I could actually get some compensation to go buy some new clothes, get some toothpaste, get some toiletries. Um, basically, I was trying to solve the problem for you. I was getting more and more pissed off. Um, I spoke to the Box House Hotel reception and they said, tell you what, pack, your, pack, pack the Viagra up, put it in a case, leave it if the concierge, and if, they, if we manage to do something with it, we'll give them the bag. But probably won't happen. They also said that I should call the police, but this genuinely was the look of when I did call the police, of the policewoman who arrived after I had three Jack Daniels and Coke, <laughs> said, uh, ma'am, this isn't really our problem and we've got better things to deal with in Brooklyn. Um, and Viagra in this country is probably illegal. Um, but to that point, anyway, uh, she was quite pissed off. Um, eventually, I then get a call uh, two more days later from my concierge saying a very sorry looking man has come back with a Dunlop suitcase and swapped his case for mine. And little did I know, but I found in the hidden bit of Facebook a message uh, that said, hey, we left your bag at the hotel. We spent all day yesterday trying to call BA. Had to go to the airport today and wait a few hours to sort it. Our hotel never told us that anybody called looking for us, even though we kept trying to call BA. Hope you enjoy the rest of your time in New York. I was leaving. Uh, what are the odds of two people on the same flight having a Dunlop bag? Um, so thanks, uh, Mr. Uh, like your Viagra. Um, but basically, this is a, an exact case of service failure. It's not only service failure, but service recovery failure. Um, and I'm going to tell you that this is such a huge topic, so I'm only going to open up tiny little bits that I'm interested in um, in this topic, um, but I hope to write more about this in the future. But we can categorise a service failure as a, a service performance that fails to meet a customer's expectations. And a good service is one that enables a user to complete the outcome that they set to do. What's the cost of failure? What does this look like? So in crude, very commercial uh, terms, in the US economy, companies lose more than 62 billion annually due to poor customer service. And it's anyway, anywhere from five to 25 times more expensive to acquire a new customer. So by ensuring that services don't fail or that we deal with failure at the point of failure, we can actually keep customers because it's more expensive to acquire them. But it's kind of more serious when it gets to stuff like this. You might have remember the cervical cancer screening stuff that was in the news around women being turned away. There was some similar stuff around breast cancer screening as well. So when services fail, they can be way more critical than just the kind of commercial, crude commercial terms that I'm talking about. And we see this on a daily, daily, well, daily mail basis, um, uh, looking at headlines like this. 
um, uh, describing things like big IT systems being the, you know, the worst and most expensive contracting fiascos in the history of the public sector. I think that was at the Daily Mail. Yeah, probably. Um, so failure is so entrenched in our language and mental models that we expect it at every turn. And a lot of it where we don't take risks to try new things is because we're trying to manage uh, the risk uh, of failure. One of my favourite examples of, of exemplifying this mental model of failure uh, in our kind of general day-to-day um, -day lives is a project by an artist called Harriet Lowther, who was actually in the year that I graduated, graduated art school from. Uh, it was called the Big Thank You Project. And she wrote hundreds of thank you letters to companies saying, thank you, Blue Tack, for your service and allowing me to stick paper to the wall. You know, thank you, Jessops, for printing all my stuff during art school. And the letter that she sent to Jessops had an immediate response to say, to provide you with a response, we need to conduct an investigation into the issues that you raised. They hadn't even read the letter, the expected failure from the word go. In fact, Harriet, Harriet's exhibition was beautiful. It was like all these framed letters and gifts that she'd been given by different companies. But she had to write back and say, I've experienced no problems with you. I was writing to say thank you for the excellent service which everyone does at Jessops provides. Once again, thank you. So we expect failure at every point. And Francis mentioned the project that we'd done, uh, it's 10 years ago now, but My Police, where we opened up our online feedback tool, which the police thought was a terrible idea, we thought it was great, um, for the public to say what they want about the police. And it was really risky because they were scared of being seen as a failure. But actually 50% of the responses when we did an analysis on it were positive, were actually a thank you. So we, we need to not be scared of failure, we need to learn how to better deal with it. So I'm only going to pick a few of my favourites, but you're going to see again an insight into my very strange and sad life of screenshotting things that go wrong. Um, but why do services fail? So services fail when the brand promise and your expectations don't match the experience that you're given. Um, so I don't know if anyone's heard of OFO. It was a thing that took off in London, but it's basically one of the dockless bike schemes. Um, you can go on your phone, find out where the bike is, locate the bike. It's like a kind of adult game of hide and seek for service designers, quite exciting. Um, but the promise is that I can go, if you remember the title, go anywhere you want to go on two wheels. Like, literally, not anywhere, but I'm thinking London, you know, in a kind of broad remit of where I can go. But the first time I used it, I got deducted like 20, I don't even know what the points were, but I was deducted 20 points for going outside of the, the allotted area. So the service failed me because my expectation was I could at least get to Lambeth from Hackney, which is like a 20 minute cycle, but I'm not allowed. And let's not even talk about the UI as a failure because I'm not sure how you're supposed to know where to go, but that's a failure in my sense. And being able to locate bikes as well, when you're a service provider and you're sort of selling this experience, um, when you're not learning from how your service is actually w working in real life, you're sort of failing. So this is, um, I'm basically giving away a big GDPR thing here. I've tried to give, like, get rid of all my personal details, but I live here um, if you want to find me and hang out. Um, uh, someone just said, oh, don't stalk me. That's weird. Um, but this was me looking for an awful bike when I had a flat tire on my normal bike three uh, days consecutively. And you can see that the bike's not moved. And I was like determined to find that bike. And I spent, I was late for meetings, like spending like 40 minutes trying to find the effing bike. And then I looked across my flat and it was fucking here. <laughs> And somebody kept it, kept it hidden from me. So this idea of freedom, the brand expectation that I can use it doesn't match up and that's a service failure for me. So we've really got to look closely at where brands are. Very quick example as well, wanting to rent a car on the day, wheels when you want them, right? So I want them now, <laughs> well, in the next hour. But signing up, uh, the, the APIs are, and the, the governance behind this isn't actually able to fetch my license. So three weeks later, I get my zip car card. So what we really need to think about when we're designing services is that we set really clear expectations across your service design and that brand development shouldn't be taken in isolation to service design. And we should look at what the brand is trying to say, and bring the principles of it in into, into what we're delivering. So another reason my services fail is when there are dead ends. So like you, I want to pay my council tax, give the council and the local government some money. Um, this was a text message I got from my local um, provider and it was saying, you know, go here online or call. And the reason I wanted to call is because it told them that I actually was due um, like a lot of money and I wasn't, wasn't sure about what money I should actually be paying. So I gave them a call. This works. So we didn't get anywhere. And then I went back to the letter and I was like, right, I need to probably find a way to go online. It's telling me all different ways that I can, what I need to pay. So then I tried again. Thank you for calling the London Borough Tax Council Tax Hotline. I'm sorry, our offices are now closed. Our office is open from 9am to 5pm, Monday to Friday, from 9am to 5pm. You can register to view your council tax and business rates account and secure the online and at www.myaccount.hackney.gov.uk. 
I'm sure you're all feeling the pain, but then when you go online, you can't pay online. So we end up in these cyclical loops of not being able to do anything, and it's inherently frustrating for, for everyone. So it's a really basic principle, and I know it's really obvious to you, but it's quite fun to pull these things apart. Make sure there's no dead ends. Just make sure that you don't end send up sending customers into dead ends. And make sure that you test your service as a multi-channel experience through multiple use cases and use live scenarios to do it. I often see a lot of... Um, uh, organizations we've worked with who've done quality assurance but they've only really tested the digital component of it so we need to look at a kind of multi-channel way of, of thinking about that. So services also fail when we're overexposed to the infrastructure behind them. Um, so if you've ever been caught in a power out, energy companies get the brunt of that because lots of people don't actually understand how electricity gets into our homes so we go to our own touch point that we understand. But actually, uh, you've got to look at the people who are the grid providers. So the, the top kind of SEO on Google for this is explaining to people, if there is a power out, don't call your energy provider, call, call the grid. So as customers, we, 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 we shouldn't really have to know who's actually powering stuff because it's kind of hidden from us to keep it quite, quite simple. And one of the examples I've been using recently, I don't know if anyone's used this product. Anybody in the room? OK, I fainted first time. You basically <laughs> it's really sad. send a prick of your blood. Um, well, it's actually a squeeze, which, makes, which is why I fainted, um, uh, to this, uh, this service, and they'll kind of like test you to see if you've got like uh, diabetes, like high cholesterol, low cholesterol, um, if you've got like any vitamin deficiency. Um, so I used it, and uh, about two weeks later, I had this uh, email come in, and I opened it, and it was just like how to decrease your bad cholesterol and increase the goods. But I hadn't even had any results yet. <laughs> I was just like, oh my God, I'm going to die <laughs> from eating like large. No, I don't eat large, like, not like, but I'm going to die. And so I went straight on to try and like connect with Thriver. Um, I think it was a Saturday. And this online chat was like, you can chat to us anytime. But it was actually like saying, we'll be back on Monday. So what, what Thrive, I think, is trying to do, like many of these services, is something I'm, tr I'm trying to hire it as a service. So it takes away me having to go, not, I don't not have to go to doctor, but it takes away the Monday to Friday premise because I feel like what I'm trying to hire is an everyday service I can use in my time. But what it's actually doing is masking the fact that it works with an infrastructure that's based on a Monday to Friday model. So you can start to unpeel when you look at services in this way and they fail you that they're actually, all they're doing is trying to mask a, a kind of uh, model that we're used to. What happened anyway, if anyone from Thrivers in the room, I hope you've used your own product, but no one has, so um, is actually it goes into spam, so it's just a little help for you. Um, and then you can find your results. But even in the instructions, it's very clear that you're to take your test Monday to Friday and send it early on the Friday so that it gets to them in time so they can test it. So we really need to be careful about um, uh, l giving, giving people like myself, like a service user, freedom to use the service at any point, but actually not being really having that freedom. Similar for um, Dart Charge. I um, don't know if anyone's ever been charged by Dart Charge, um, but they don't actually, I was a new driver, they didn't actually tell me I need to pay to use the bridge. Um, so I got, I got charged, I got a very long letter, tried to fix it, basically complained, um, and then I got this really long letter that I just couldn't understand. It said, Dear Sarah Drummond, um, the Secretary of State <laughs> has received a notification from the Traffic Enforcement Centre. I don't know, I'm talking to Dart Charge. I don't know who they are, um, about a witness statement that I was like, oh my God, have I made a statement um, that you made against the PCN on the grounds, blah, blah, blah. So I started like freaking out, like, who the hell is the Secretary of State? Like, I don't know. Um, so kind of like a funny point around that one is, but don't force your users to become experts of your systems. Think about what your user needs to know about your backend systems and what they don't, and be agnostic of your organizational structures. So when we're designing services, we have to be agnostic of those structures. And just to kind of riff off of Sarah's stuff, I mean, I'm just going to say content design, that's enough. <laughs> um, so another reason that services fail is when, and this is quite a big one, I think, when there is no flex in the system, and that actually kind of stems from a lot of engineering models. Um, but we often get, uh, get this. Oh, no, ring. Find out how to get interest tax summaries for the whole year downloaded. I run a business, it's really boring. <laughs> Please give your account or card number now. Uh, Sorry, a bit drum and bass, just a GDPR. Let's keep it, uh, yeah. Yeah, 
Are you feeling the pain? Now, please give me your date of birth. Okay, from the back of your card, please say or key in your three digit security code now. Don't have my card on me. What's that guy? Guy, what? Eight. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have my card on me. I just want to ask you a question. Sorry, I'm having difficulty. Would you like to speak to an advisor? Yes. Please hold for an advisor. Customer feedback is really important to us. Don't you me snorting. No. No, really not. Anyway, sorry, that's just like, this is, that's literally my life. I have a Dropbox full of those. I'm really sad. Um, so there's no flex in the system there for me to get, get what I want. Um, and, and that's a, a bit of a kind of trite example in terms of uh, showing up Bank of Scotland's phone line. Um, but actually getting a bit more serious, um, we need to have flex in the system in order to meet people's wants and needs. Um, we'd be, it's Snook. I'm not going to talk really about much of Snook's work today, but one of the projects we've been uh, working on is supporting the homeless, uh, the, basically the system design of homelessness in West Sussex. And we've been talking a lot to providers there about not talking about user needs and the tools of service design, because actually they don't really allow for any flexibility. They're very transactional. Um, and I just love, this has kind of hit us all hard in Snook when we were hearing some of the stories coming back, but one of the providers that we work with was saying, you know, some of the people that we support is as a human, I need help with all of it so that I can change. And I thought that was kind of a really poignant thing that we were um, considering and what we we're trying to do there and building more relational services for people that really understand wants. And I kind of always come back to these sort of components around when we're designing services, particularly services that are less transactional and scaled up, but much more about care or the welfare system or health. And how what we need to do when we're thinking about uh, the delivery, which is mostly done through frontline staff at that point of care, those real kind of emotional parts where you get what you need, is helping them understand what they can flex. And there's two things they really need to know is what are the risks, and being very clear about what the risks are that they need to manage, and what are the outcomes they're trying to achieve, and giving them autonomy in order to achieve these. And what that looks like in practice is, is a really great, um, if you've not heard of it, it's worth going looking up, um, uh, a design called the Wigan Deal, which is part of Wigan Council, um, and they're doing some phenomenal work there in the way that they commission and design services. But one of the things they changed um, was looking at uh, an elderly man with dementia who spent every day being collected by a minibus and taken to a centre that he hated. Um, and they managed to take his care costs down from £2,000 to £20 uh, a month by just getting him a taxi and taking him to a local rugby club and buddying him up with somebody because they listen to what he want. And I think that typifies a different kind of approach in making sure that stuff uh, doesn't fail and we actually manage those risks and outcomes. And that looks a little bit like this. So the risk for staff is don't let, you can't travel alone, but we'll get him in a taxi, so that's 20 quid. Um, you could spend up to two grand. Uh, uh, you, you can use any time of day and the outcomes we want is for him to be active and build a network around him. So I always talk about when we're designing services and trying to reduce failure and making sure that frontline staff have that flex to do this. And we kind of know it from lots of studies, there's lots you can go and look at, but frontline employees really do, I think, play a crucial role during both service delivery and service recovery. And if, because they have an understanding of the constraints due to what the budget is and being the closest observers of, of customer demand. So we really need to kind of uh, uh, invest in allowing that flex for frontline staff so when stuff does fail, or to stop stuff from failing, we can make that happen. And there's been kind of a lot on the internet recently about like, are we more relational services? Are we more transactional services? And how do we design for that? Well, I think in order to reduce service failure, we need to design both relational and transactional services. And what I mean by that is that there is the autonomy and the flex in the front-facing conversation and relationship between people um, delivering uh, and, and co-creating and receiving services with people. So, Services fail when customers can't solve their own problem. Uh, you might have been privy to one of these. You get to the, the train station, it's out of service. But what you do as a customer is you're able to solve the problem yourself by jumping onto another service. And we're quite robust as human beings and actually like being able to tell, like be able to redesign and figure stuff out ourselves. And this is my stepdad's, um, uh, I love this. I've been using this for years, buzzing. Uh, he lives at number eight and I've been buzzing uh, number five for years, <laughs> like it's pissing them off so much. So as humans, we're really robust at solving stuff ourselves. And one of the great examples I've really enjoyed for a, a while, and this might not continue as a service scales, but Monzo in the early days were really good at explaining problems to me. 
Um, so when I double paid at Marks and Spencer's for Prosecco, very first world problem, um, they were able to just explain why that had happened. So I was able to go and solve the problem myself. So not blame the bank, go and follow up with Marks and Spencer's. But the most pertinent example I have of late is Uber. Um, and this, oh, this is just me being silly. But anyway, um, like many of us, I left my phone in an Uber cab at two in the morning. I'd had a little bit to drink. Uh, and I got in touch with them because I obviously couldn't use my phone, so I went home, walked 40 minutes in the rain, uh, got home, told them that I'd lost it. And they sent me some tips saying, well, all you need to do is log into the app. I was like, well, I don't have my phone, so <laughs> that doesn't work. Um, oh, right, go on your laptop and do it. But if, like you, most of us have got two-step authentication set up, you can't get in. <laughs> so it doesn't actually work. And I got quite pissed off and trailed Uber on just saying, getting really angry. Um, and I couldn't quite work this out, like why they couldn't get this use case right, because there must be, they know that number one thing that people lose in taxis is phones, so they should understand that failure point in that use case. And they really should, because when you start looking at their service, they've actually got their own support accounts up that are pretty much specifically there for people that are pissed off and uh, lost stuff, that they actually send lots of bots out to help you. But because I'm a clever human being, I came up with my own plan to get my phone back. So I remembered that my partner's phone was tracking me because they were walking me home one night so I could actually see where my phone was. So I was following it around London, moving around in this Uber. Bearing in mind, this was about 3 a.m. in the morning. Um, I'd slightly sobered up, so I'm, I'm not uh, proud of this behavior. Um, but I, uh, I decided to go out on my bike and chase my phone. <laughs> and I don't know if this will work, but it looked a little bit like this. That's me going uh, quite slow just in the same time distance, that's the taxi moving. You can see how this went. I cycled until 6.20 a.m. in the morning. <laughs> it looked a bit like this, just kidding. Um, for real, that was a bit stupid. Um, and, uh, but then I realized that, <laughs> when I realized I was being very silly and would never catch it, also the radius of where you can find your phone is actually quite big, so it wasn't actually gonna be pinpointed. But hey, I was looking out for a big black car in London. Um, <laughs> I found that my phone was actually settled and rested in Chadwell Heath, and then it ran out of battery, so so lucky we got that screenshot. We then used a vehicle checker, we found it. We went all the way out to Chadwell Heath. This is me finding the car very hungover, <laughs> with not a lot of sleep, being like bad cop, and, I, and then we had to knock on doors, and I just went total bad cop mode and went straight to the door, and this door opened, and I said, you got my phone. And this guy was like, I think you need to talk to my brother. <laughs> and basically, we got my phone, yay, um, thanks, found it. Um, and I solved the problem myself. But that whole time Uber had been telling me, I'd been calling and calling and saying, we can't connect you with the driver. I was like, I need you just to connect me with the driver so I can tell him he has my phone because it's under the seat and I don't know if someone might take it. I don't trust everybody in London or in an Uber cab. Um, so I was trying to solve the problem myself. So the thing that I always say to organizations is test common failures with users and, and let them solve problems and find out how they might solve their own issues as well. And also test with people who are not like you. So we often get a lot of people testing with their friends and mates in a pub. But at SNP, we're really trying hard, and I know a lot of the industry is as well, to try and make design more inclusive. So test with people who are not like you. And that's just a little shout out if you're interested in. We just launched this, uh, which is about inclusive recruitment in design. Um, so we're trying to build more inclusive teams that we can test with. So finally, um, failure is often defined uh, in relation to expected outcomes. And this is quite a biggie, I think, to finish on, is Often when we think about how successful a service is, it's actually really defined by outcomes that are set before you as a designer even get to the table. So if you look at things again, like in, in the headlines about um, work programs failing, things like this, we get people into jobs, but we don't keep them there in jobs. So is that a success or is it a failure? It's successful st statistically because we got some people into work, but was it success in the long run and what do we deem as the proper outcomes? And we have problems with models that, like this, like things like payment by results, classic PBR models, which tend to cherry pick and actually focus on people who are not the most vulnerable that need support. So when we're setting outcomes, um, we really need to think about that. And one of the pieces of work I, to kind of bring that to life, did with the Scottish Government was actually looking at how you get people in school to make the right decisions and what touch points are in front of them uh, to, to make the right decisions to go forward in a kind of positive way. And in Scotland, we kept using this language called getting young people into positive destinations. And the first thing I did was sit at a table and, and say to all the policymakers, what do we mean? What do we actually mean by positive destination? Because right now, the policy, if I got a young person into a lifelong career in McDonald's, that's a positive destination. But it's a success, it's not a failure. So we really need to challenge this. And that comes back to this, uh, sorry, I, had to, I just used a pixelated Daily Mail picture because I don't care about them. Um, but uh, that comes back to this, that we often operate around this space, but actually, 
We're governed by what public policy says if we're working in government services. Our services have an impact on public beliefs, whether they're objective or false. And the media and political discourse both uh, impact on this and this. So we fail because this, this and this in our service design and delivery. And we really need as designers to look up, down, left and right at the contributing factors on our service from policy to different external influencers. And it's not necessarily our job, but I think it is actually part of our job. We really need to look at that. So we're not just looking at what the service looks like, we're looking at policy. And I say start with values, debate the outcomes, and don't worry if you can't change it all. And lastly, we fail when we don't accept that failure is inevitable. There's a kind of um, theoretical concept called normal accidents, which is basically says like, everything will go to shit at some point. Like that's, uh, that's don't read the book, that's basically it. Um, but the system is complex, it's so tightly coupled that there's always gonna be catastrophic potential. And while we see people designing for service recovery, like um, Eurostar, when my train was delayed, they're giving out sort of quick and easy ways to exchange, pandemonium, but not actually testing their service recovery because they couldn't deal with the loads, um, we really need to think about actually designing better for these. And a really nice example I saw was from LNER, when my train was delayed, but they kind of replaced that, that sadness, not sadness, annoyance, um, with free Wi-Fi. So they're sort of swooping in to sort of save the day with their service recovery. So we have to design the service recovery processes as much as we design the services. And we often never put any time or effort um, into that. So I'm gonna stop here, but say this, that service failure really isn't the responsibility of the designer alone. Um, when we design services, we are, we are all designing. So it's not just designers, capital D, we're all designing in a system. Um, we are all responsible for it, whether you work in policy, you work in finance, you work at the front line. Every design decision that we're all making is contributing to a system that sometimes doesn't work for people. Um, so our responsibility isn't just for designers. We need to look up, down, left, right, um, and work with other people. And I put this in because I knew I'd fail at my presentation. Stop here if I'm running over time, because I had some more, but I'll stop there. So <laughs> hopefully um, you've enjoyed my rants and moan. Um, it's made you think a bit about um, actually when services fail. And um, the last thing I really wanted to say on that is sometimes it's really hard to know what good services look like and good service design looks like. But if we start actually with what's bad, we can inverse it and understand actually where we need to go. So thanks for listening.